All right, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, thank you for joining us for today's uh, webinar on the entry-level OTD program here at Boston University. Uh, my name is Christopher Krauss, and I'm the Director of Graduate Enrollment here at Sargent. I'm very excited to have with me two guests. Uh, the first is Professor Ellen Cohn, who is the Director of the o OTD program. Hi, Ellen. Hi, Chris. <laughs> and we also have with us uh, Didi Liberti, who is the Senior Program Coordinator for the OTD uh, department. Hi, everyone. Welcome. Welcome to BU. <laughs> Virtually. Mm -hmm. All right. So before we uh, get started and before I turn the floor over to Ellen, I just wanted to uh, quickly review today's agenda. Um, so we'll talk a little bit more about, um, you know, choosing OT as a, a career path and some of the considerations that you might want to think about before you begin the application process, although I know some of you have already started your application, which is great. Um, we'll then dive into a little bit more detail about Sargent and more specifically the OTD program. Uh, we'll dive into some of the details about the curriculum and some of the ways in which our program is different compared to other programs out there. We will wrap up the webinar today uh, by spending some time uh, talking about the admissions process. I'm sure some of you have some questions about that. And speaking of questions, um, you are able to certainly ask questions throughout the webinar using the chat feature. Um, so if you can navigate to the chat, you'll be able to submit questions throughout the webinar. Uh, we will reserve time at the end to address any questions that come in throughout the presentation. And you're also welcome to um, wait until the end to, to submit, submit your questions. So with that being said, I am going to turn the floor over to uh, my colleague, Professor Cohn. Thanks, Chris. Good afternoon, everybody, and thank you for joining us. Uh, first and foremost, I want to congratulate all of you for choosing occupational therapy as a career path. It's a very exciting profession, and it's a very dynamic profession. And I personally think it's a really um, exciting and important time to be considering a uh, career path in occupational therapy. I assume many of you have done some research and have followed the US Bureau of Labor Statistics predictions, which are projecting occupational therapy to continue to grow uh, as much as 18% from uh, the year 2018 to the year uh, 2028. And certainly given the recent uh, changes in our culture with the COVID pet pandemic, I think there's will be even more opportunities and tremendous need for occupational therapy. So we are very well poised to be a viable profession uh, for decades to come. It's also a really exciting time for occupational therapy because there have been tremendous changes both in healthcare and education and special education. And many of these changes are very congruent with the values and need for OT. And many of the values have been long-standing values within the profession of occupational therapy, and now healthcare is embracing some of those values. One of the big shifts is an emphasis on what we call value-based care. So payment for services are based on the value of the service and the quality of the service versus the quantity of the service. So what that means is instead of reimbursing occupational therapists 
for the amount of time that they spend with a patient or client. It's really focused on whether or not uh, the patient achieves the outcomes that were negotiated with the occupational therapist. And we have always been very concerned with client-centered outcomes. So we're delighted that uh, healthcare has shifted to this perspective. It's about accountability, efficiency, and effectiveness. And all of this is predicated on this belief of really attending to what matters to clients and what's important to clients and attending to the reasons that people seek out occupational therapy in the first place. You may have heard the terms patient-centered care or client-centered care or family-centered care. And all of these uh, phrases really emphasize that the patient is at the center of the care and their perspective and their voice and what matters to them is essential to uh, the, the service delivery. And those ideals have always, always been core to occupational therapy. So what's happening now is that um, healthcare and education is more congruent with the fundamental principles of occupational therapy and our profession is very well poised and situated to implement intervention in these frameworks. There's also been a tremendous shift in our uh, understanding of living with chronic conditions and uh, an emphasis on health promotion, health, pre uh, health prevention, and community-based practice. And all of these uh, things are, again, very congruent with occupational therapy's perspective on trying to support people to live meaningful lives in the context of disease or disability. More recently, we've seen a tremendous shift towards telehealth, and we've even seen reimbursement uh, be provided for telehealth. Our professional association is working very hard to make sure that, that those reimbursement models become permanent because we've seen the tremendous benefits of telehealth and certainly the COVID pandemic has um, highlighted how valuable uh, a telehealth perspective can be. In the education fields uh, with our special education uh, laws, the um, IDEA, there's been a shift and a focus on including transition plans for uh, students who are uh, 16 and older and really developing plans to help those students prepare for their transition out of special education and into adult roles. And that's another area where there's tremendous opportunities for occupational therapy. So all of the changes in our society and our culture are really uh, situating uh, Occupational therapy is well situated to address some of these needs. So some of the key principles of occupational therapy, a focus on meaning, what matters to clients, people's quality of life, and belonging and inclusion are also uh, fundamental ideas. And I keep reflecting on uh, what the what this pandemic has uh, taught us all in our society and our culture, and many of us have experienced social isolation because we can't connect with our friends and our families in the same way, and it's affected everybody's quality of life. And these are the kinds of things that OT is tremendously interested in. We're also very focused on belonging and inclusion and trying to create a equitable and inclusive experience for all people. It's also what I think is somewhat of a confusing time to be applying to occupational therapy programs because there are dual points of entry. So 
um, someone can become an occupational therapist by completing a two and a half year master's program, or you could complete a three year entry level OTD program. And uh, Boston University has been uh, offering an occupational therapy uh, degree for decades, and for many, many decades, we offered the, uh, the master's degree. A number of years ago, the profession made the decision to develop entry-level doctoral degrees, and we assessed our faculty, and we assessed our values, and we decided that we really wanted to shift our program to an entry-level doctoral degree. So some schools offer both degrees. We offer just the entry level OTD degree. The benefits of the OTD, and I believe you will see this in many of the OTD programs across the country, is that they are focused on leadership and they are designed to prepare future practitioners to address the complexity of current practice and really prepare students with the skills to shape future practice to beyond the general level, generalist level of providing intervention. And we feel that we need to prepare people at this higher level to lead the profession forward. So there's multiple needs in our professions and there's needs for practitioners to be prepared at various levels. And we're committed to preparing people to be leaders who can shape the future of the profession. In these OTD programs, there's also the opportunity for uh, students to develop advanced knowledge and skills in the areas of either clinical practice, education, research, program evaluation, policy and advocacy and sometimes these advanced skills overlap just a couple of considerations to think about um, as you're applying to ot programs there are um, many many programs all across the country and uh, there are many many fabulous uh, programs across the country. And I just wanted to say a few words um, about where these programs are situated. Because uh, where the OT program is situated in the academic setting will impact your learning experience, they will impact the culture, they will, it will impact the resources, um, and your whole experience. So I, I just want to talk about this for a moment. So some OT programs, such as Boston University, are situated in what we would call a um, research one university. So that is typically a large university with multiple schools. So for example, Boston University has Sargent College of Health and Rehabilitation Sciences, but we also have a law school and a medical school and a business school and a school of fine arts and a college of liberal arts and a school of hospitality. So, and a research university is dedicated to both education and providing cutting edge research. So we, feel that at Boston University, we have the best of both worlds because we have access to a very, very vibrant research community. But Sargent College itself is a very small college situated in a large university. And the OT program is a relatively small program. We have a cohort size of about 40 to 45. So, we have a very small program 
it's an intimate program where students have the opportunity to work very closely with faculty and get to know them on a first name basis and are in and out of their offices all the time. Another context where OT programs are situated is a what we would call an academic medical center. So often the College of Health Profession is situated on a medical campus that is connected to a hospital. So those programs tend to be a little, um, have a very strong sort of medical model emphasis because they're closely aligned with the medical school and with a hospital. There's also OT programs that are situated in dental schools in graduate schools of arts and sciences. And we also have OT programs that are situated in a freestanding institution focused on educating health professions, such as our colleagues across town at um, Mass General IHP, the Institute for Health Professions. So they, they, their, their sole purpose is to educate health professionals. So it's just something for you to think about um, as you look at programs across the country. Of course, today I would like to talk about the benefits of Boston University. And I've already mentioned that we um, have the benefit of a large university, but the intimacy of a small college. Within our college, uh, we are preparing occupational therapists, physical therapists, athletic trainers, speech and language pathologists, and uh, dietitians in the field of nutrition. So we have the opportunity for a very rich interprofessional education, and you would be learning alongside uh, students also studying to be a healthcare professional in another profession. We also have a school of social work and a school of education and a school of engineering. So there are tremendous opportunities for interprofessional collaboration, both within Sargent College, but also across the university in a broader way. Uh, I think we all know that Boston is a tremendous hub for both healthcare and education. So the fact that we are situated in Boston provides us with endless opportunities and endless opportunities to partner with our community collaborators in a range of settings. A little bit more about Sargent College. I mentioned the other departments. Um, all of our healthcare professional programs are very strong and highly regarded both within their professions and within the academic community. We also have 35 research labs and clinical education centers. So if any of you are interested in research, there's, again, unlimited opportunities. Within the occupational therapy department itself, I mentioned that we shifted our master's program to an entry-level OTD. We also have a PhD program in rehabilitation sciences for students who want to pursue a PhD and a research-based career. I know it's probably um, a bit overwhelming to think about this as you're considering uh, a three-year OTD degree, but we do have a bridge program where students can do a dual degree and pursue a entry-level OTD, and then in the second year of the entry-level OTD, students have the opportunity to apply to our PhD program. Those programs are typically four years, 
So that would be seven years of education. And this combined program uh, is designed so students could complete both degrees in six years. So it's not for everybody, but for anybody who is interested, we do have that option. And it's not something you would have to decide um, upon admissions, but it, it, it is something you could note in your application process that you have an interest in that program. We also offer a post-professional program, which is online. And that program is for folks who already have their professional degree in occupational therapy. And as the profession moves towards this entry level OTD, more and more people who have were prepared at the master's level are seeking out the OTD. Um, and we have been offering that program for um, many, many years. I'd like to spend a few minutes now talking about the vision and the focus of the occupational therapy program at Boston University. So our vision for the program is that we are really focused on producing leaders, as I said earlier. And we define leaders as folks who will be agents of change. And sometimes we think of leadership as the person who is the sage on the stage or the person giving the big speech or the person who's in front of the room. And we think of leadership in a much broader way. And it's really about having the curiosity and the willingness to look at the current situation and assessing and asking ourselves the question, are we doing the best we can? Is this the best intervention for the client uh, who's in front of me? And um, are, we meet, we, are we meeting people's needs? And if not, what is it we want to problem solve and critically examine the situation to figure out how to intervene? So that's what we mean by being an agent of change. And it can happen in large ways and in front of a large group, and it can happen in very small ways in a one-to-one -one interaction with a client, or it could happen through policy change or research or education. So there are a variety of ways in which people can make change. I also want to say a few words about our values and our commitment statement, uh, our commitment. And as a profession of occupational therapy, our goal is to support engagement in occupations uh, across the life course. And we acknowledge that there are systemic, environmental, personal barriers that limit people's opportunities to engage in meaningful occupation. And particularly for people who may be members of underrepresented groups or economically disadvantaged. And we are very committed to preparing our clinicians to advocate for access, inclusion, equality, belongingness, pluralism, and social justice. And we are working hard to try and prepare our students to demonstrate um, a culturally critical consciousness. This is a huge task and we're not perfect at it. And we invite our students to collaborate with us as we provide inclusive teaching um, and learning practices. I also want to acknowledge, uh, especially given the current um, protests in our, in our uh, country, that we unequivocally support um, and affirm the idea that Black Lives Matter and we condemn the brutality and killing that Black people have been subject to by police and other members of American society. 
and we are very committed to sustained efforts to bring about change in our program, in our teaching, and in our preparation of our students so we are not perpetuating injustices. And as I said, we're not perfect, but we are very committed to striving to be better. The structure of our curriculum is a three-year program. It begins in September of the first year, and it is completed in August of the third year. And it's what we would call a hybrid or a blended program. So the first two semesters are on campus at the Boston University Charles River campus. And then in the first summer, there are eight credits of online courses. So those are two courses and it is a part-time load. In the second year of the program, it's the same model. Uh, two semesters on campus and then eight credits online. And then in the third year of the program, the students complete what we call level two fieldwork, which is fieldwork full-time in the situation of practice, uh, supervised by an occupational therapist. So in the fall, that's October, November, December. And then in the spring, it's January, February, March. And then in April, our students take a two credit mentored online course with their academic mentor uh, to begin final preparations for uh, the doctoral capstone experience, which is uh, 14 weeks doctoral practicum, and that occurs during the final summer. So I want to point out that for some people, if they move to Boston to attend the program, they could live anywhere the first summer and then uh, li uh, be in Boston the second year, fall and spring. And then the second summer, students can live anywhere. And we have relationships with fieldwork sites all over the country. So often students will come to Boston for the first two years and then live someplace else and complete the rest of the program uh, outside of the Boston area. And we purposely designed the program so it would provide maximum flexibility for people. And there is um, some room during the summer months for people to do other things including part-time job because graduate school is expensive and people need time to work while they're in grad school. Some of the advantages of the BU curriculum is that we believe that we have designed a curricula that is congruent with the values and the reasoning um, that occupational therapists utilize to provide best practice. So that means that our curricula is a, we call it an integrated curricula, and it's integrated in multiple ways. So we utilize what we call a life course perspective. So we think about uh, human occupational performance across the life course. So when you compare the BU curricula to other OT curricula, it might be a little confusing at first glance because we do not divide our curricula by diagnostic condition or by age. So we do not have a course specifically called pediatrics or a course called a geriatrics. Um, we also don't divide our courses by conditions, so we don't have courses labeled adult physical dysfunction or mental health. And that's because we believe that there is no health without mental health, and we didn't want the design of our curricula to perpetuate 
thinking about human occupational performance in these ways because we are a very holistic profession and we look at things across the life course and our curricula is designed to support that kind of reasoning. We also do not have a separate research course or a statistics course because we teach evidence-based practice which uh, is designed to provide our students to develop habits and reasoning uh, related to utilizing a evidence-based approach in all of their work. So you will see evidence-based practice courses integrated through the entire curricula. So the way the, the curriculum is designed, it's very scaffolded and recursive to support applied learning. So the things that students are working on in the first semester are then built upon and layered upon and we keep returning to ideas and concepts and assessments that we have learned earlier on in the curricula and work towards increasingly applying them to our practice context. We have hands-on and practical learning every semester uh, on campus and students have the opportunity to work with people who are living with chronic conditions and disease or disability throughout the curricula. So there are plenty of um, very practical applied learning experiences throughout the curricula. As you look at occupational therapy programs around the country, something else you might want to pay attention to as you're trying to assess which program is the best match for you is to attend to how the level one fieldwork experiences are designed. And level one fieldwork experiences are practical experiences um, that are congruent with coursework. And every single OT program in the country designs their level one fieldwork experiences a little differently. At BU, we offer our students four different placements. So every semester that a student is with us here on the BU campus, they are placed in a level one fieldwork setting approximately a half a day each week. Uh, and certainly this is um, before our COVID pandemic and now in the context of the pandemic, we are looking at some alternative uh, ways. So these level one fieldwork experiences are integrated with a small group seminar. Students are in community-based practice settings uh, with occupational therapists. So I'm going to uh, shift to this slide, which shows this integrative model and how our level one fieldwork works. So the students um, spend a half a day a week in the practice setting for their level one fieldwork, and then in that same semester, we divide our cohort into small group seminars, which are approximately 15 students in a seminar. And in these integrative seminars, the students integrate their observations from the situation of practice um, with what they're learning in their courses. So these petals on the outer, the outer edge of this image show the courses in the first semester of the curricula. So the students are integrating concepts that they're learning in these courses with their observations on fieldwork and then having an opportunity to reflect on those in the integrative seminar. The courses are also integrative with each other, so that's why there's arrows pointing to all the courses. And I always like to say that we are a small faculty, 
and the faculty is very much into each other's business. And I say that in a positive way. So what that means is the faculty knows what is being taught in every single course. So you might be learning about analysis and adaptation of occupation in one course and functional movement in another course, but in your occupation across the life course, the professor might say, well, as, as you learned about in functional movement last week, let's think about those ideas in relation to the concepts we're talking about in this class. So the classes um, are very, very integrated and connected. So this is a quick overview of the specific courses. I know it's small and hard to see on this webinar. You're certainly invited to go to the website to look at these courses in more detail but you will see that we have these integrative seminars throughout the curricula in the fifth semester, the spring of the second year. The integrative seminar is called Occupation-Based Practice with Groups. And in that course, the students go out into the community and co-lead a group for the entire semester. So this, in that way, the students are continuing to build on their practice skills. I'd like to say a few words about the doctoral capstone experience. It's a mentored 14-week doctoral practicum in, and project. And these doctoral capstones are the major distinction between the OTD and the master's programs. And at BU, our, our projects are focused on practice, research, policy and advocacy, program evaluation, or quality improvement. And the way these, pra these doctoral capstone experiences are designed um, occurs in multiple ways. So sometimes our practitioners and our colleagues in the community will come to us with an identified need and work with the faculty to identify an idea for a doctoral capstone project. And then we collaborate with our, our, our colleagues in the community and write, write up a description of the project. Sometimes faculty will generate an idea for a project and write it up for a description. And what we do is we post all of the potential projects for our students to review, and then they can select their top uh, priorities, and then we will uh, match students to their interests in the second year of the program. However, sometimes students have a very specialized interest and maybe they have developed relationships um, prior to attending OT school and really have a passion or idea and want to tailor design their doctoral capstone experience. So we have a mechanism for a student to do so and to develop a proposal and a petition and if we have the resources, we will support a um, custom design uh, doctoral capstone project. And here I've included a couple of examples of doctoral capstone projects previously. One of our students uh, worked in uh, the uh, Suffolk House of Corrections Women's Unit in uh, to integrate OT into the criminal justice system and we're now very proud that that student is now working in that setting. We had another student working with integrating the role of OT in disaster relief at the international level. We had an OT work on the development of OT in primary care. 
We had a student help with a local agency. It's a nonprofit agency that provides outdoor adventure experiences for people with disabilities. Um, and we had another student work in Baltimore conducting a needs assessment for mothers who are experiencing homelessness. So those are just a few examples of the kinds of projects our previous students had com completed. And there's a more extensive list on our website. So how to apply? I'm sure you're all eagerly uh, waiting for me to talk about this information. Our process is through um, the OT Common Application System online, um, which is now open for applications for our early decision, December 15th deadline. Uh, we also have a regular decision uh, deadline of December 7th. We, the requirements are official transcripts from undergraduate, the um, personal essay, which is the same personal essay for all OT programs throughout the country. There are two BU short answer essays. I'll go over those in a moment. Three letters of recommendation are required, the prerequisite coursework, and then our most competitive applicants are invited for an interview. So the interview is also considered in our application review. If applicable, uh, we would need TOEFL scores. And I want to point out that GRE scores are not required and are not part of our application process. And we will not be looking at GRE scores. I know you have maybe have to post them for other schools, but we will not be looking at them. I also want to point out that we do not require observation hours. Rather than uh, requiring observation hours, we're looking for our students to have an understanding of the depth and breadth of the field of occupational therapy and we feel that that can be accomplished in a variety of ways and uh, I know you have to uh, submit observation hours for other programs but it is not a requirement for us and we do not look at those materials in our application review. The prerequisite courses are listed on our website human anatomy, physio, uh, human gross anatomy. Um, students can take that uh, through a um, special course that we offer to our students the summer before matriculation, a stats course, abnormal psych, and developmental psych. And the two short answer essays, they are limited to 400 words. The first one focuses on uh, being an agent of change. And the second one focuses on critical consciousness and diversity, equity, and inclusion. There are multiple ways to finance graduate education. We do offer merit scholarships. You do not have to apply for these scholarships. They are automatically considered uh, for all applicants based on our holistic re review of applications. So there's no additional information to submit to be considered for a merit scholarship. And these scholarships are awarded uh, in the initial admissions letter. We also offer student employment. We offer graduate assistantships that are also awarded through the admissions process and students do not need to apply for these GA awards. They're, they're an additional scholarship. We have research assistantships uh, opportunities to work with our faculty who um, are conducting research and we have additional opportunities through the BU Student Employment Office and many of our students have reduced uh, 
the cost of living by being graduate assistants, uh, resident assistants in the dorms, or also serving as it, what we call a GRA, which is a graduate resident assistant. So graduate students have the opportunity to supervise the resident assistants. So you don't have to work directly with the undergraduate population. You're, you're, you're overseeing the RAs in the dorms. So I have been talking a lot. So uh, I see that we have some time for questions. And I know that Chris has been monitoring the chat box and looking at the questions. So I will turn it back over to Chris and he can moderate our question and answer period. Excellent, thank you, Ellen, for that presentation. Um, as Ellen suggested, if you have uh, questions, you can go ahead and submit those now through the chat box. Um, I see that a number of folks have sent in a question throughout Ellen's presentation. Um, one of the first questions, or one of the questions that I'm, I'm seeing come up a few times is um, whether it is more beneficial to apply through the early decision um, round, which the deadline is uh, September 15th, so just around the corner, or should people wait to the regular decision? What would you say to that, that Ellen? That's a great question. Thank you. Um, so I will answer that question by saying it's a equal opportunity process. So applying early does not necessarily provide students with better odds of getting in like, like the early decision process works in the undergraduate space. What the early decision uh, process does is allow you to hear earlier in the year about whether or not you have been accepted. And that time frame is from September to December. So I would my recommendation would be to, if you're ready, apply early. The, I would say my recommendation would be certainly to think about making sure that you have all the materials in the best possible um, condition you can when you submit. So we look at all the materials um, in a holistic way. So I would not recommend rushing to get recommendations and write your essays and do all of these things to get it in by September 15th if you need the time you need more time to think about these things in a thoughtful way. So if you're ready to apply early, that's great. If you're not, then apply in the re regular decision pool. Um, I hope that answers people's questions. Perfect. Um, so we have quite a few questions here. So my apologies if we don't get to your question in time. But if we don't get to your question, we can always um, you can always send us a, an email to ot@bu.edu and we can address it there. Um, but I'm going to try to get through as many of these as we can. Um, so Alexa has asked if the interview process um, will change because of COVID-19. Great question, Alexa, thank you. Yes, it will. So all of the interviews will be conducted uh, virtually this year. Taylor has asked, um, can I be in the process of completing a prerequisite course while applying? Yes. So uh, all of the, uh, we, we just need documentation that you have completed the prerequisites before you matriculate into the program. So if you were working on those prerequisites while you're applying, that's fine. Perfect. Um, we have a question here from Madeline who 
wants to know if uh, research opportunities and experiences are available just to those in the combined OTD PhD program or if they're also available for the, the standard, I guess, OTD program. Great question. Uh, so that's one of the benefits, I think, of, of um, attending an OT program that's situated in a department that is conducting a lot of research. Uh, so there are multiple, multiple opportunities to be involved with research. There are paid positions, there are unpaid positions, all of the faculty are um, engaged in some form of scholarship and are constantly looking for ways to include students in uh, their work. So there's unlimited opportunities. So one th can I, I just oh. want to say one thing right. about that. Um, when applying to OT school, this is my bias, but I think it's it's a big commitment, and um, I think it's really important to find a program that is a good match for you. You want to be successful in the program, and we all want you to be successful um, and be successful occupational therapists. So one way to really determine if a program is a good match for you is certainly to attend to the curricula, but also spend some time on the websites and look at the faculty bios and look at the research and the work that our faculty are doing and look at their expertise. And if those bios are really exciting to you, then I think that's an indication that that particular program is a good match for you. Excellent. So Jessica has asked um, just about the uh, tuition rate and whether there's a different rate for out-of-state students. I can answer that question. Um, we have the same uh, tuition rate for in-state and out-of-state um, students, and you can um, find more about the, the cost of attendance on our website. Um, one thing to note is that the the tuition rate is for the fall and spring semester only, and there is an additional cost for um, some of those credits that you take in the summer, but all of that is outlined on our, our website if you want to dig into the numbers a little bit a little bit in a little bit more detail. Um, let's see here. Okay, so we have another student here asking about um, the BU essays, Ellen. Um, for our essay about um, that addresses the um, agent of change mm -hmm. experience, um, is it preferred to write about an experience that's related to OT or can it be any type of experience? It can be any type of experience. It doesn't have to be specific to OT. In fact, we don't expect student, all applicants to have OT experiences because we often receive ap uh, applications from students from a variety of undergraduate majors, a variety of experiences. So we're just more interested in uh, your perspective on what it means to try and really enact change. We have quite a few questions on international field work opportunities from Nicole, Delaney, and Brittany, um, perhaps a few others. Um, are there any opportunities to complete field work abroad? There are, we do not have opportunities to complete a level two field work abroad, um, but our, we do have opportunities for students to develop capstones experiences in a um, international context. We also have some opportunities for students to travel abroad uh, during the summer months. We have a relationship with a, a program in India and we travel, we have traveled to uh, Ecuador with another OT program. Of course, those experiences are um, 
on pause for the moment, and we're certainly hoping that uh, there will be opportunities in the future. But they're on pause due to the pandemic. Um, we have a question here about letters of recommendation from uh, Clara, who's wondering um, if the letters of recommendation that we require, the three letters of recommendation, if those are submitted separately or those are the same that are submitted through OTCAS and those I can confirm are the ones submitted through OTCAS. So um, you may see, you know, other programs who have, you know, may, they may require more letters of recommendation. Uh, we're really just looking for three um, and it and they can be received through, through OTCAS. Quite a few questions about admissions and whether our admissions process is technically rolling. Um, Ellen, did you want to address that question? I would not say technically it's rolling. <laughs> <laughs> I would say that there are that are there there are two cycles. There's the early decision cycle and the regular. So we the students who apply early decision, their materials are reviewed in the fall and the interviews are in early December with decisions right before the winter break. And for those who apply in December, the materials are reviewed December through February with interview invites going out. The interviews are in the end of February with acceptance letters going out mid-March. Excellent. Um, so we have a few, few other questions here. Um, quite a few questions about our student cohort and whether uh, we primarily have folks who are coming straight from undergrad or folks who've been out in the field for several years and are coming back to grad school. How would you characterize our student cohort, Ellen? That's a, that's a great question. Thank you. So uh, I would characterize our student cohort as 50-50. I would say half of the cohort are students who are coming straight through undergraduate to graduate school. The other half of the cohort are people who have uh, taken some time, anywhere between one and 15 or 20 years post undergraduate, pursued other things, and then are applying to graduate school. And students, as I mentioned before, come to OT from all kinds of undergraduate majors and all kinds of experiences. The other feature of our cohort, I think is kind of interesting, is that it's about 50-50 geographically. So what I mean by that is I would say 50% of our cohort are students who from uh, the Northeast Corridor. And I, you know, I would say the Northeast Corridor from Maine all the way down to like maybe Virginia. Maybe that's not the Northeast, but from the East Coast Corridor. The other 50% are students from all over the country. Excellent. And it looks like we probably have time for. Just one more question here. I know there are quite a few. So again, if we don't get to your question, please reach out to us via email. Um, but one student wants to know just about the, um, Haley had a question about um, scholarships and assistantships and whether those are kind of equally distributed between the early decision and the regular decision round. The answer is yes. Yes. There really is no no preference given to early decision, um, and and typically I would say it's um, an equal amount of funding available for for both rounds. So as Ellen mentioned earlier, you know if you have your application materials together and you feel confident, you know we encourage you to apply early decision. But there's really no setback to applying through the regular decision round. 
All right, we're going to wrap up today's webinar. Um, I just wanted to thank our guests, um, Ellen and Dee Dee. Dee Dee is often the person who may be answering your emails on the OT account. So um, feel free to reach out um, to us and be happy to answer other questions that we didn't get to. And I just wanted to thank you all for, for tuning in with us this afternoon. Uh, I also want to thank you for joining us and end by what I began with, which is congratulations for identifying occupational therapy as a career pursuit. Good for you. And I look forward to being your colleague someday, no matter where you go to OT school. Exactly. Of course, we hope you come to BU. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you so much and enjoy the rest of your day. We hope to connect with you again soon. Take care. Bye, everyone. Bye.